I came to realise that young adults and teenagers are unaware of what meningitis actually is and how it can quickly be considered more than just a cold or a headache. The main symptoms of meningitis are flu like symptoms as well as vomiting, high temperature, stiff neck, sensitivity to light, rapid breathing and the general feeling of being unwell as well as a distinctive skin rash. I went and talked to the college nurse asking her that does she often get students in talking about meningitis and how important it is for students to be aware of the symptoms. Have you had any students come to you about meningitis? Yes, I have had students come to me before about meningitis, uh, often because they're doing some research or they're doing a campaign as part of their course, so they actually need to find out about leaflets or they want to find out more information so they have got their information accurate for their um, research. Thank you. Um, what do you think of, of the posters regarding about meningitis? Because we realise there are posters around college, but they're not really noticeable, but what do you personally think of them? Some of the posters I think are very, very good. And they are actually from Meningitis UK. They gave us the posters, and I think some of them are very effective. Some of them not so much. They do little leaflets and little cards that are very effective. Um, often I think it's a good idea to get maybe a young person's input on what they think the poster should look like because that is who we're mainly aiming for because that age group is most affected. Do you think students are aware of the symptoms of meningitis? I don't think so. I don't think they are. I think everybody just thinks it's a rash and once you get a rash in your body then you've got meningitis. A rash is often one of the last symptoms and you're actually really ill before a rash appears. So no, I don't think they know the symptoms, no. And why do you think the students aren't aware of the seriousness of meningitis? I think it, it happens it's because people at that age, say 16 to 24, are young and they don't think it will happen to them. So even though they are being told about the seriousness of meningitis, I think they think, oh, I'm fine, I'm fit, I'm well, I'll be fine. So they don't really take in what they're being told. Lots of information available. If you go on the web um, or just on the internet and type Google in www.meningitis.uk, then you will find out a host of information. You'll be able to download e leaflets, go to your um, GP surgery. In college, we've got lots of leaflets everywhere. I actually have a lot here in the first aid room. Um, so yes, so there's lots of areas to be able to get some leaflets. There are two types of meningitis, viral and bacterial. Viral meningitis is the most common one, as the symptoms for this type of meningitis can be most, mostly mistaken for flu. Viral meningitis is mostly common with children and teenagers and is widespread during the summer months. Bacterial meningitis is very serious and should be treated as a medical emergency. If left untreated, it can cause severe brain damage and also affect the blood system. This type of meningitis is mostly common with, with children under the age of 5 and babies under the age of 1. It is also common with teenagers between the ages of 15 to 19. I went to talk to Matt Croxo who works for Meningitis Now. His job is to go and do home visits to families who have been affected by meningitis. I also want to see what his experience were like as well. What is it about working for the charity that you like? Well, I work from home and cover the, the Midlands, so cover a huge region. The best bit is working with the people out there. We get some terribly sad stories, um, but the way that people fight back against a disease like meningitis is quite inspiring, really. So it's quite nice to go home at the end of the day and think I've actually helped someone. Meningitis Now was just recently formed in 2013. What do they actually aim to do with those that have been diagnosed with meningitis? Okay, so meningitis now formed from a merger with the Meningitis Trust and Meningitis UK. 
So that now means that we do lots of different things to help. So we're involved in research into vaccines and prevention against the disease. Um, we do awareness about the disease for groups that may not be aware of what to look out for, or for families who have had whatever experience of the disease. So that can range from giving out financial grants yeah. to help people or emotional support and counselling. Um, I saw on the website that our manager is now that you do family support. What does that actually entail? Um, I initially with a with a case when I find out about it the first step normally for me is to go and do a, a home visit and just to yeah. listen to what happened to people. Sometimes it might be that there's more work to be done so okay. it might be that there's counselling sometimes we run a scheme called one-to-one -one where we put people in touch with other people that might have had meningitis a while ago and they're a bit further down that journey. Amy is a student here at college and she has kindly agreed to share her story about her mum getting meningitis and what it was like from her point of view. My mum was diagnosed with meningitis in December 2012. Um, she'd had flu symptoms for a few weeks before that and she just thought it was normal flu. She went to the doctor, they got some tablets. Um, and then she. I got a phone call on the way to college one time, it must have been a Monday or a Tuesday because I was helping HND projects I think and um, my dad rang me and he said he'd just rushed my mum to hospital and I just I burst out crying. Um, I remember going to see her that night and she looked she looked terrible, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. She was, she looked old and she, looked, she just looked really, really ill. She'd changed so much from the morning. She'd had got all these wires in her and she was in an isolated cubicle and um, but to wear a mask before we could see her and we could only see her because we were under 18. We could only see her for 15, 20 minutes I think and it was really bad because she was in there over Christmas. Um, I literally became a single mum that, that, those few weeks and um, I had to help my sister and my brother when, brothers when they went to school, I had to do their packed lunches and I had to collect them and take them and I had to, you know, when they were on holidays I had to make sure there was, they got fed all the time because I didn't, I couldn't go out anywhere. But when the mum's in hospital and they can only see them for 50 or 15 minutes of every few days, it's, it's not easy. But um, yeah, I remember my dad managed to get us in Christmas Day to see her. Um, we brought her a little tablet for something to do. She was so bored, but she, she's useless with stuff like that, so <laughs> she, she, she couldn't figure out how to use it. She got um, TV that they have in the hospitals. She was trying to work Facebook on that. She kept getting really annoyed because that's the only way she could contact me because she had no signal, but uh, it was so slow. No, she came out New Year's Eve, sorry. Remember that? She came out New Year's Eve when she spent New Year's. She, we watched the fireworks on the telly with her. So that, that was nice, but yeah, it was, it was tough, but I did what I had to do. <laughs> About 3,200 people get meningitis in the UK. That makes it roughly 10 people per day. Meningitis can kill, and it can kill quickly. In some cases, it can only take four hours for the toll of feeling fine to be completely unwell. For some people, it can lead to mental and physical disabilities. Support groups are available. If you search for Meningitis Now on the internet, it will help you find your nearest one. There is also the Meningitis Research Foundation, which will help you give you more information that you may need.